Father, as you've already been speaking to us. Lord, we pray, speak to us. Lord, as you've already been affirming and speaking through what has been sung, and Lord, we say, come, speak through your word. Lord, I pray where there is a word out there, I pray it would be born in here. Lord, we ask, Lord, there would be something transformative this morning that goes on, even as we hear your words. Lord, we pray, we say, Lord, our hearts be receptive. Hearts be receptive this morning to the word of God. Amen. 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 Our Father. This is perhaps the most well-known, maybe the most spoken prayer ever, and it starts, Our Father. I just wonder, though, whether we genuinely come before God and expect a daddy-son, a daddy-daughter relationship. I wonder if we genuinely come before God and say, Father, Dad. Or whether it's just become something that we speak and we get used to speaking and it fits so nicely in a good prayer that we've been taught when we were young. But we're invited to know God as Father, as Dad. We're invited to see our faith through family eyes. One of the family, one of the kids looking up at our dad in heaven. We're starting a mini series, just pausing on the Psalms. To be honest, I thought it might be easier to pause this Psalm series than it has been. I, I'm, I thought after three months, maybe, you know, we could do with a rest, you know, and then we'll go back into the Psalms refreshed. Do you know what? The Psalms has been perhaps one of the most refreshing series I've ever had got the privilege to be a part of. I could carry on, but I do trust that in our planning, God had something in mind that he wanted to speak to us at this moment about being our father. So we'll continue. We'll look for a little period, just four or five weeks on the father heart of God. And this morning, we're looking at the father heart of God in his son, Jesus. That's where we're starting. Our father going to start with Malachi but we'll be quickly going into Matthew 17 so if you've got your Bibles don't be confused you can start turning to Matthew 17 but I'm going to just read to us some words from Malachi these this is the last book in the Old Testament following these words it goes quiet for nearly 400 years until Jesus comes okay so just hear Malachi 4 verse 5 God says this behold I will send you, Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And then silence. This, that's, that's kind of the last proclamation in the Old Testament. I will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and children to their fathers. Our Father. Now turn with me to Matthew 17. This is titled probably in your Bibles, The Transfiguration. And this just means a moment where the true nature of Jesus is revealed. Okay, so Jesus is fully man, fully God. He is no less man and no less God. Somehow in God, he is 100% both. And yet when he comes, we know he's come as a servant. He's come and he's laid aside his majesty. That's what scripture says. But here at the transfiguration, we get a glimpse of the true nature, the the side of Jesus that we hadn't yet seen, we'd only heard about. That's what the transfiguration is. It's a little glimpse into who he really is. And and so it reads here, I'll just go from verse 2. Jesus was transfigured before them and his face shone like the sun And his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here. 
One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. I, I love this account. And I really love Peter's, it's like a, a glorious picture. And then you've got Peter just, he's just like you and me, isn't he? I just think he's just like you and me. He's seen something amazing. And they've come from a busy time. They've come from a tough time. They've, they've been chased by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and Jesus has been talking about death and that makes everyone feel a bit uncomfortable. And, but now they're on the mountain, the holy mountain. And it's like, he's just amazed at Jesus. And so what does Peter do? He's like, should we... Should we set up camp? Yeah. Should we stay here? Let's not go back down. Back down there, they're all horrible. And let's, let's stay here. This is an amazing place. Let's set up camp and we'll see maybe how long we can stay here. Does that sound like a good idea, Jesus? And, and um, yeah, Jesus is like, this isn't where we're supposed to stay. This isn't, a, this isn't a staying place. You've seen something and God has spoken and we must go. But I, I just find it amazing. And, and Peter, he just thinks like you and me. It's like, finally, something, something amazing. Let's stay here. And, and I, I even love it where it says in, in verse, um, verse 5. Yeah, my eyes are getting bad. <laughs> verse five, I'm going to have to start preaching with glasses soon. So um, you can be ready for that. He, he says, while he was still speaking... While Peter was still speaking, while he was still talking about making tents and, and maybe I'll pitch yours here and yours here and who wants the biggest and, and should we centre around a campfire? You know, Peter's still talking and, uh, and while he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And I just, I even love that little insert. You know, Peter, I don't know if you remember when he goes to Cornelius' house, it's the first time the Holy Spirit's been poured out on the Gentiles. And while it says, while Peter is still speaking... The Holy Spirit comes. And I love that. It's like we get a little, a little insight that Peter likes to talk a lot. You know, he does quite a bit of talking. And so even God's not prepared to wait until the end of Peter's speech. It's like, why are you still, God overshadowed him with this glorious cloud. And, and then it comes to the New Testament. Why are you still, the Holy, like, just, Holy Spirit, you better go now because we can't, we can't wait till the end of Peter's speech. But it's, I, I love this. And we see something of the awe and majesty. And then from this cloud, let's read on. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. Stop talking by that point. But Jesus came and touched them saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus. I find this an amazing Account. We'll read on in just, in just a moment to see some more, but an amazing account. So holding those two together. So Malachi, last book in the Old Testament, finishes by saying, uh, when Elijah comes, then there'll be a restoration of, remember, fathers and their children and children and their fathers. And then we come here to Matthew 17 and Jesus is standing there with who? Elijah and Moses. There's something going on that we're supposed to notice. We're supposed to notice that, okay, so Elijah's in the mix. Oh, what does that mean? Okay, that means a restoration work. That means God's going to do some restoring and, and it's going to be with fathers and their children and children and their fathers. We're supposed to connect the two. The Jews would have known this. You know, there's a reason that at the, at the cross, we were looking last week at the last moments of Jesus' life. And when he's on the cross, you remember that moment where there are people stood around and they're mocking and, and they're cursing and doing all that. And then one of them says, hang on, let's just wait. Let's see if, do you remember? If Elijah comes. Have you ever read that and thought, well, that's weird. What a weird thing to insert there. They're all mocking and jeering and there's Jesus on the cross. And then someone says, let's see if Elijah comes. Well, that's because they were thinking of Malachi. They were thinking of the scriptures. What, what should happen before this glorious day, before, before God? Well, Elijah's supposed to be around, isn't he? Well, let's just see if he turns up. And so we see in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration, Elijah. What they were looking for at the cross in the last moments had already happened. And we'll see had actually already happened even before this. And what's spoken of in this moment? We get this amazing window into the heavens. Two occasions, the audible voice of God is heard. Okay, and on, on, this is one of them. 
and, and all the disciples are there, and then the audible voice of God, however you picture that, maybe Samuel Jackson, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone like that, and this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Wow. The audible voice of God. Do you recognise this line? Have we heard that somewhere before? That, that very same line, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Does anyone remember where that is? Yeah, I can see the words. I can't hear you, but I can see baptism. Jesus' baptism. Jesus' baptism, we, we get the second glimpse and the second audible voice of God that says over Jesus at the very start, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The two same words. You get two glimpses into the heavenlies of, of, and you get to hear what's going on. What's the father saying twice? And he's saying the same thing on both occasions. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You get the impression if you could hear more often, you'd hear the same thing more often, don't you? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. When God looks at his son Jesus, He cherishes, he loves, he enjoys, he admires what he sees. God the Father loves his son Jesus, loves him. You get two windows into what's the Father saying right now and it's both the same. I love you, my son. This is my son. This is my son and I love you. I'm so pleased with you. So pleased. I want to just take a moment to look at what it is that's specifically spoken. These, these words, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. It's actually a line that's spoken in Isaiah 42. So if you were to look in Isaiah 42 verse 1, Isaiah, as so often is the case, right, that the prophets catch a glimpse of what God is going to then speak out later on. But Isaiah 42 says this, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved uh, with whom my soul is well pleased. Isaiah 42, one, speaking of Jesus. This word pleased, ratsa, in, in the Hebrew, meaning delights in. Yeah. Behold, uh, behold my beloved with whom my soul delights in. God is so happy with his son. God affirms Jesus using this phrase that his soul is well pleased in Jesus. God delights in him. God delights in his character. God delights in his obedience. God delights in his choices. God delights in what he's spending his time doing and how he's doing it. God delights in his son, Jesus. This moment would have just lodged in Peter's mind as he's heard those words. Remember, he's face down because suddenly he's stopped talking. Suddenly there's the voice of God. He's collapsed. And, uh, but this would have lodged in his mind forever because towards the end of Peter's life, he's writing to Peter 1.17 and he records this, that he had seen, so Peter's remembering his life and he records that he has seen the majestic glory of God on the holy mountain and he's remembering back to this moment, the transfiguration moment. He saw the majestic glory of God. He saw the deep pleasure of the heavenly father speaking over his son. Colossians 1.19 says this, God was pleased to have the fullness of his nature revealed in his son. The fullness of his nature to be revealed in his son. God loves his son. He's starting to get a picture of it. He so delights in his son. He was happy to have the fullness of his nature revealed. That's why Jesus didn't say, if you've seen me, You've seen the Father. And, and Jesus was happy to say that. And the Father is happy to say that the fullness of my nature is revealed in my Son. There's a likeness. There's a family resemblance going on between Father and Son here. That, this is one of the things that blows me away about creation the most, isn't it? Where you see a dad and, and a son or a mum and her daughter. Or, you, however, or even a grandparent and their grand... And you're like, wow, there's a family resemblance. It's the nose. Like, how is there a family? How does that work? You know, my mum's actually said as she's been looking after my little boy, Seth, she gets flashbacks to when she was looking after me. I mean, I've seen pictures and 
it's, it's terrible to say, but we even have the same haircut. It's like, oh no, I should be, I should be cutting my son's hair different to how my mum cut my hair. But I don't know. We've got to carry on the family resemblance. So sorry, mate. You know, get that bowl out. And, um, but it's like, how does that work? How does a family resemblance work? It's stunning, isn't it? I, I think it's amazing. There is a family resemblance in God. And, and there's, there's a point with children. I don't know when it happens, but it's when that family resemblance is no longer a good thing, it's a bad thing. There's, there's a moment, isn't there? We all know it because we've all grown up. And at some stage, someone said to us, you look just like your mum. And we're like, oh, no. <laughs> and it used to be a good thing, and now it's a bad thing. And I don't know when that happens. It might be the moment where we suddenly realise maybe they're flawed, just like we are. You know, when you're young, they're just perfect. Parents are perfect. And then there's a moment where you're like, maybe they're not perfect. And, and maybe it's that moment where suddenly we're challenged and, and we don't like what we see. God the Father and the Son are perfect. And so in his 30s, there is a family resemblance. And Jesus is like, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I look just like my dad. I, I have just the same heart, just the same temperament, just the same tendencies. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And he's so happy with that because of their perfection. And you see the father, and the father is still saying the same thing over his son after three years of ministry. Ah, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. There is a strong family resemblance, and it's a good thing, and it's a beautiful thing. God was pleased for the fullness of his nature to be revealed in his son. John 3, 35 says this, the father loves the son. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. The Father loves the Son and everything is now in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. This makes sense as to why Jesus then says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He wasn't puffing himself up. No, God had given him all things. So he is the way, the truth, and the life because everything's been given to the Son. And so you can't expect to get to the Father unless you get through the Son because God's given everything to him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And you just get this delight of the two with each other. This is my. The start of that phrase, Jesus is God's. This is my. God loves to associate himself with his Son. This is my boy. He loves to say, this is my. With whom I am well pleased. 1 Timothy 1.11 has this interesting phrase that I just want to decrypt a little bit with us. It says this, the gospel is the glory of the blessed God. And that kind of wordiness you might be quite used to when you read Timothy and it's like that kind of pattern and wordiness. The gospel is the glory of the blessed God. Let me rephrase that. If I just swap the kind of two Christian buzzwords, so gospel, which means good news, so gospel means good news, and blessed, which as we've been looking at in the Psalms, means deeply happy or eternally happy, okay? So you've got those two Christian buzzwords decrypted. So now let me, let me rephrase this. The good news of the glory of the happy God. This is the gospel. It is the good news, which is the glory of of a happy God. We have a happy Father. We might be used to seeing our Father and suddenly we get into that kind of almost prayer that's a little bit of a drone. Our Father who art in heaven. And it's like, whoa, this is surely painting a different picture of our Father. This good news of a, of a glory of a deeply happy God. He is deeply happy, friends. What is he deeply happy with? Oh, he's so happy with his son. Oh, he's so pleased with his son. And then it says, listen to him. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. I think we're supposed to notice that that's an addition. The first time at Jesus' baptism where he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. That was it. But now he's saying the same thing, but there's an addition. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. 
Listen to, and we're supposed to see the addition to this. We're supposed to pay attention. What is it that we're supposed to listen to? Well, let me read. So they're on their faces, terrified because of the glory of God and the audible voice. Jesus says, rise and have no fear. There's something of the love and happiness of God being poured out from heaven, which at the same time comes with a holiness and a terror. And the two are coming at once. I think sometimes we want to go on one extreme, which is, oh, God's just, he's just so, he's fine with you as you are. He's happy with you. And he's kind of a happy-go-lucky God. And you do whatever you want. He'll be cool. He's cool, Dad, you know. And so we go kind of this liberal way. Or, or we go on the other end of the spectrum. It's like, he's such a stern God, you know. Unless you, are, unless you are perfect, you will not please God. Unless you are always, and it's like, oh, man, somehow, somehow we're to see both the affirmation and the outpouring of the love of God and his holiness at the same time. There's, there's oh, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And there's also an awareness of like, but this is God speaking, you know? The two are happening. And so Jesus is saying, rise, have no fear. This is your father speaking. And when they had lifted their eyes, they saw no one but only Jesus. Suddenly it's changed again. Back to Back to how things were. Go, I'll go read on now. Verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, tell no one. Remember what, Jesus, what God the Father said? Listen to him. Okay, so we're still listening to what Jesus is saying, particularly clo- carefully. Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? But we know why, don't we? Because Malachi prophesied it. Yeah? Still with me? Okay. Why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And Jesus answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. Jesus just broadened out what God's going to restore, hasn't he? It was fathers and their children and children and their fathers, but Jesus said all things. There's something of a restoration of the father and the son and the son and his father that is the catalyst for a restoration of all things. It starts with the father and his child, but Jesus isn't done there. He's looking for a restoration of all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognise him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the son of man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Ah, okay. So there was, so Elijah has come. He's come prophesying that there's a, a way, there's a, there's a Messiah coming. This was what John the Baptist's message was, wasn't it? Get, repent, get ready. Because the Lord's coming. And then he saw Jesus and he said, behold, here he is. Fathers and their children, children and their fathers. Jesus is both reminding them of Malachi. And they would have gone, oh yeah, because Elijah was going to bring about these things. But then he's also broadening it out to all things. God's got a big plan for creation, friends, for a new heavens and a new earth. He's not just stopping with with one parent and child issue that really needs to be resolved. No, he is restoring all things, heaven and earth. That's his plan. Jesus is linking something of his suffering to come with the Father's love for now his children. It's very confusing if you've just heard the affirmation of a father to his son and then his son has to go and die. It's very confusing. Jesus is saying, no, it's part of the plan. In fact, to make his point, I I just did some reading around and I noticed that the very first miracle that that is recorded straight after, you can look at it in your Bibles, Matthew 17, so he's just been explaining these things of a restoration and we know it's the fathers and children, children and their, their fathers. And the very first miracle is recorded, Jesus heals a boy with a demon. What happens? Well, guess what? A father comes to Jesus and says, Lord, have mercy on my son. I was like, wow. Of all the miracles to come straight after this moment, after this moment of seeing Elijah and Jesus connecting the two of a restoration, and it's going to start with the the first miracle that he does is to restore a father with his sick son and a son with his father. What an amazing God we serve. What an amazing God we serve. 
a desperate father who has no hope. How will he ever see his son well, continually getting hurt? And well, Jesus heals him. And a father in that moment is restored to the son and the son to the father. I think that's supposed to point to us of God's big, good plan to come. When Jesus has come down and, and then he heals this boy, there's something that the, the disciples say, which I, I've always kind of puzzled over. And as I was studying this, it kind of made sense. They're, they were like, well, why weren't we able to heal this boy? Do you remember? And Jesus, what does he say? It's, he says, well, this demon can only be cast out with prayer. And in some translations, prayer and fasting. And whenever I've read that, I guess this reveals something of a religious tendency in my heart. I've always thought, well, okay, there's probably a certain amount of prayer and time in prayer that can actually achieve, you know, I, I don't know how it works, but maybe you have to rack up, say, 15 hours or, you know, and, and then it's like, then, okay, now you're able to do this. As I was reading this, I just saw it totally different. Picture it like this. Where has Jesus just been? He's been up on the mountain, hasn't he? In prayer. What's he been hearing? He's been hearing afresh, for the second time, the audible voice of God delighting in him. That's what he's been hearing. That's what prayers looked like. It's, it's looked like the father saying, I love you, my boy. I love, I'm so pleased with what you're doing and how you're doing it. And so Jesus comes down the mountain and with the affirmation and love of the father in his ears, he knows this is what I should be doing now. It's not about racking up a certain amount of prayer hours, friends. It's not about religious duty that unless you tick that box, okay, well, you can't actually do these things because you haven't, you haven't ticked the box, you know. We know, that's not, we know that's not the Christian faith. It's about being so aware of the love of God that we know what his will will be in this, this circumstance. Jesus has the words of a father ringing through his ears, I love you. And he's got that so fresh. And so again, he knows what to do. That's what it's looking like. If we want to impact the world for God's kingdom, I think we need to get more often in front of God and say, show me. Show me how you love me. Just reveal it to me, Lord. Just speak again, Dad. I need, I need a fresh... I, I've been going through, been put through the mill recently. Just tell me again, Dad. How do you see me? Tell me again. Oh, I feel so stretched right now. I, I'm being pulled in this way and that way. I can't get my full attention here and work stretch my family. Lord, I just, just tell me again you love me. Refresh my heart again. Say again the words of affirmation. This is what we need. When we get before God, Lord, speak. Speak. God has a great love for his son. And now I've spent most of my time hopefully building a case for how the father loves the son and how the son loves the father. Now at the very end, I want to include us, friends, okay? This is where we feature. Often we spend a lot of time just trying to persuade one another, no, he really does love you, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted us to understand, wow, the father, oh, he loves the son. Okay, we can all agree on that. You know, the words he's been saying are just crazy, now I want to invite us into this happy gospel that is the glory of God. John 15 verse 9, as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, yeah, we get that. Cool, he loves you, Jesus, so I have loved you. Oh, wow. With that same affirmation, that same love. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Wow, you're being brought into this very same love of God, friends. This is how we feature. If we could just get our heads around how much the Father loves the Son, and then we've just got a window in seeing, and he loves us in the same way. Wow. Let me just... It was actually a moment we were praying earlier this week. Um, as an eldership team, we pray... Uh, Wednesday mornings and we gathered around early and we were praying and I think it was Matt Hoyes was just exhorting us and he just got something of a fresh revelation of how much Jesus had done and he was just thanking Jesus for what he did on the cross and, and we were all listening and it was in that moment I just, I just had a new 
I guess, a new angle on, on everything that happened at the cross. And it was, just picture with me for a moment, you might close your eyes or just, just picture with me now Satan's angle on the whole thing, okay? So Satan looks at the world and he just thinks, I've got them. All of humanity, all of the billions of people who have ever lived and not one of them could be perfect. I've got them. Not one of them, probably not even for a day. Oh man, if there's any justice in God, he can't keep them. I've got them. And then Jesus arrives and Satan tempts him. Oh, he tempts him and he tempts him and he tries to destroy him and he, he tries everything he can, but Jesus is pure, spotless. Okay, there's starting to be a worry with Satan now. I've got everyone, but this one seems to be able to live righteously. He loves purely. How does he do this? And then we get to the cross. And, Jesus, and Satan hasn't been able to, to, to tempt him. He hasn't been able to attack him. It's, it's all been, but at the cross, suddenly Satan can do what he likes. You see, just the wrath poured out on Jesus, this innocent man. He's, he's charged. People are calling him guilty and he's not. They're able to hit him. They're able to beat him. Suddenly, he's, he's getting somewhere. Satan's able to do something to this one. And then there's this moment, and it just blows my mind, where he who became, who, who was, he who knew no sin, sorry, let me go back to the beginning, he who knew no sin became sin. This is what Paul writes. He who knew no sin became sin. You can imagine Satan's perspective, like even this perfect one, he's just become sin. The sin of the world has been poured on him. The only one who, who was pure now has just become defiled and I've even got him. Yes. And he goes to the death. And Satan, you can imagine, ah, oh, we've got them. The only chance they had. And then three days later, we know that the purity of this sacrifice that was given was pleasing to God. And what does it say, Romans? He raised him to life again. God raised him to life again. And you can imagine Satan's perspective. Suddenly he's losing his hold on everything. Satan, he, he's looking in this one he had, the pure one that he'd managed to condemn and beat. And, and, had this, and it's just now he's pure and white and spotless because, because God has raised him to life. He can't touch him. But not only that, the whole thing starts unraveling because then it says that we're saved through Jesus. And he gives us his righteousness because of what he has done. You can know a pure heart. You can know what it is to have your conscience cleansed. And you can imagine from Satan's perspective, he's gone from, now I've got them all, to, and he's losing his hold on the whole lot. Suddenly the disciples, who were cowards, he knew they were cowards, they knew they were cowards. They were the closest thing to Jesus, and yet even they ran away. Pathetic. Suddenly they're standing up, attesting to the fact that God has been raised to life, and he has made them alive with his Holy Spirit. And Satan's lost his hold on them. And then those disciples tell others, and suddenly 3,000 at the day of Pentecost, so this whole thing is rumbling on. And it all comes down to the love of God that was poured out. The love of God. Satan watches the weak and sinful and pathetic disciples as they are given new hearts. They're born again to a living hope by the love of God. The Holy Spirit's poured into them too, and they now share this fearless message of God who loves you. He's alive and well. He's happy and he's doing it again and again and again. And they're now included in this same love of God, not because of anything they've done. Galatians 4.4, 4, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might become and we might receive the adoption as sons. And I'd include and daughters, contextual. We'll look at that another time. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That same spirit that God saw and was delighting in is now in your heart if you've given your life to Jesus. And God looks and you can now cry out, Abba, Father. He's restoring children to their fathers or fathers to their children. Do you see what's happening? And this is the beginning of the restoration of all things. So you, I'll read on, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then...
than an heir through God. Wow, hallelujah. 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 I wonder if you would stand with me. I just want to pray for us, church. I just want to invite you, if you want, to ask God to reveal these things in your heart. You've heard it spoken and I'm trusting that a seed is going into the heart, but there's nothing like hearing your daddy say, I love you. There's nothing like hearing the same affirmation that the the son heard on that day and hearing it through Jesus. I love you. I love you. So I want to pray. And if you want to hear, then I just encourage you. This isn't an act that I get to do. You get to go direct to your dad, who's my dad. You don't have to go through me. So I just encourage you where you are, just start saying, Father, Father, our Father, just show me, Lord. I don't know what's going on in your life. Maybe it's great. Maybe it's tough. Our Father, it's tough. Would you let me know your love afresh? Father, so I pray with your bride here today. Would we be aware of this glory of a happy God, this good news from heaven being poured out upon all your people that you love us, that you love us, that you are not distant, but that you are drawn close, that you have poured out your Holy Spirit so that we might receive adoption. You're our dad, our father. I pray, speak, Lord, speak. Let us hear your love. Yeah, Father God, I pray. You may have to just put aside for a moment any earthly relationship with a dad if it's distracting. And just say to your heavenly father, I'm not going to compare you to this one. I'm not going to contrast you to my dad. I'm just asking, dad in heaven, show me your love. Show me your love. Show me your love. Show me your love, Lord. (laughs) He's happy. Oh, he loves you. Our Father God, I pray even in this place, would you reveal to us your delight in your son Jesus as well. This is where it all starts. It doesn't start with us. It starts with him and the pleasure of a good father and his son and a son and his dad and the restoration on Easter Sunday of a father with his son and now you're restoring all things. Lord, would you just delight us with a happy God and his delightful son. And Lord, I ask now that you would reveal to us the love of the Father in this place. The love of the Father. Draw close, Lord. Draw close. Thank you. Thank you, Father. As we go from this place, Lord, we ask. Lord, we ask for encounters through this sermon series. Lord, we ask for encounters through this week. Lord, we ask for encounters, Lord, as we go out of here. Lord, I pray for moments as we're walking in creation. And Lord, I pray that we would just look up and give thanks to Dad in heaven for this and for that. Lord, I pray that we would receive also just the love of the Father. Lord, increase it in our lives, we pray. Lord, we see what an effect it had on Jesus as he comes down from the mountain. Lord, healing and and praying. And Lord, we pray, fill our hearts with the love of God as we go from this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, my name's Dan Baptist and I'm lead pastor here at Jubilee Community Church. 
We really hope that something from this morning's word has blessed you and reached you. And if you'd like to talk about anything you've heard or just be able to talk about maybe faith or get some prayer, then please get in contact. You can email us, give us a call at the centre and one of the team's going to get back to you. We'd love to do this, especially if you're just thinking about what it is to become a Christian. You want to sit down and really talk that through with anyone. We also run regularly on a Sunday some Joining the Church courses. And if you want to know more about Jubilee Community Church and what it is to belong here, then you can just uh, find out online when the next one of those is going on and you can attend, have a meal, sit down, talk about it. We also have some amazing midweek group life Uh, where it's a great opportunity to dig further into your faith. Again, you can find out that on our website too. Anyway, just wanted to say hi and uh, bless you and we'll catch up soon.